Do you think aliens have consciousness? If they're organic. So organic yes. connected to consciousness. I, I mean, I, I think any any system which is going to bootstrap itself up from planetary origins, I mean, I, let me finish this and then I come on to something yes. else. But uh, from, from, from planetary origins is going to face similar constraints and those constraints are going to be addressed in similar basic engineering ways. And I, I think it will be cellular and I think it will have electrical charges and I think it will have to be selected in populations over time and all of these things will tend to give rise to the same processes as the simplest fix to a difficult problem. So I would expect it to be conscious, yes, and I would expect it to um, resemble life on Earth in many ways. When I was about, I guess, 15 or 16, I remember reading a, a book by Fred Hoyle um, called The Black Cloud, um, which I was a budding biologist at the time, and this was the first time I'd come across someone that really challenging the heart of biology and saying, you're, you are far too parochial. You, you, you know, you're thinking about life as carbon-based. Here's, mm -hmm. here's a life form which is kind of dust, interstellar dust that on a, on a, on a, on a solar system scale. Um, and I, you know, it's a novel, but I felt enormously challenged by that novel because it hadn't occurred to me how limited my thinking was. Uh, how how narrow minded I was being, and here was a, here was a great physicist with a completely different conception of what life could be. And since then, I've seen him attacked uh, in in various ways, and I, I'm kind of reluctant to say the attacks make more sense to me than than the original story. Which is to say, even in terms of information processing, if you're on that scale and there's a limit to the speed of light, how quickly can something think if you're needing to? <laughs> broadcast across the, the 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 solar system is going to be slow. It's yeah. not going to hold a conversation with you on the kind of timelines that Fred Hoyle was imagining, or at least not by any easy way of doing it, assuming that the speed of light is a limit. Um, and and then again, you you really can't. This is something Richard Dawkins argued long ago, and I do think he's right. There is no other way to generate this level of complexity than natural selection. Nothing else can do it. You need populations, and you need selection in populations, and a, a kind of an isolated um, interstellar <laughs> cloud. Again, there's unlimited time, and maybe there's no problems with distance, but you need to have a certain frequency of generational time to generate a serious level of complexity. Uh, and I just have a feeling it's never going to work. Well, it, as far as we know, so natural selection evolution is a really powerful tool here on Earth, but there could be other mechanisms. So whenever, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with cellular automata, but complex systems that, uh, that have really simple components and seemingly move based on simple rules when they're taken as a whole, really interesting complexity emerges. I don't know what the pressures on that are. It's not really selection, but interesting complexity seems to emerge, and that's not well understood exactly why I think there's that a difference emerges. between complexity and evolution. Yes. So some of the work we're doing on the origin of life is 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 thinking about how does uh, well how do genes arise? How how does information arise in biology? And thinking about it from the point of view of reacting CO2 with hydrogen, what do you get? Well, what you're going to get is carboxylic acids, then amino acids. It's quite hard to make nucleotides. Um, and, and it's possible to make them, and it's been done, and it's been done following this pathway as well. But you make trace amounts. And so the next question, assuming that this is the right way of seeing the question, which maybe it's just not, but let's assume it is, is, well, how, how do you reliably make more nucleotides then? How do you become more complex and better at, at, at becoming a nucleotide-generating machine? And the answer is, well, you need positive feedback loops, you know, some form of autocatalysis. So that can work, and we know it happens in biology. If, you've, if this nucleotide, for example, uh, catalyzes CO2 fixation, then you're going to increase the rate of flux through the whole system, and you're going to effectively steepen the driving force to make more nucleotides. Um, and this can be inherited because there are forms of membrane heredity that you can have, and there are effectively you can if a cell divides in two and it's got a lot of stuff inside it, and that stuff is basically bound as a, a network which is capable of regenerating itself, 
then it will inevitably regenerate itself. And so you can develop greater complexity. But everything that I've said depends on the underlying rules of thermodynamics. There is no evolvability about that. It's simply an inevitable outcome of your starting point, assuming that you're able to increase the driving force through the system. You will generate more of the same. You'll expand on what you can do, but you'll never get anything different than that. And it's only when you introduce information into that as a, as a gene, as a, as, a, as a kind of small uh, stretch of RNA, which can be random stretch, then you get real evolvability. Then you get biology as we know it. But you also have selection as we know it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how to think about information. Um, that's a kind of memory of the system. So it's not, yeah, at the local level, it's propagation of copying yourself and changing and improving your adaptability to the environment. 